Good evening. Tonight in Omnibus, we have a film about a pianist and a composer who's been described as the most original jazz musician that Britain's ever produced. His name is Stan Tracy, and he was 50 last December. Now, 34 of those 50 years have been spent as a professional musician, and yet Stan Tracy never had a music lesson. He taught himself the piano and the crafts of notation and composition. And composition in jazz terms is the creation of a sort of launching pad from which individual performers can take off with their improvisations. The best-known Tracy music is his 1965 Suite for Jazz Quartet, inspired by Dylan Thomas's Under Milk Wood. It's being done at the Camden Festival in London tomorrow night. And after Easter, Stan Tracy will be taking it on tour from Taunton to Inverness. Several excerpts from the Milkwood Suite are included in tonight's film. And there's more Tracy music of many kinds, from solo piano to jazz octet. And the story of his life in music is told by Stan Tracy himself in the South London setting where he was born and where he still lives. I left school at the age of 12 due to the outbreak of war and the whole school was evacuated and I think there were two of us who weren't. It was boys' adventure come to life for me. I thoroughly enjoyed the war. I used to read the papers and find out what was happening and follow all the maps and the advances and the withdrawals and then at night there would be air raids and I, I just thought it was great. I went to the pictures so many times um, per week. I used to get a little pocket money, but I discovered in the wardrobe my father had a huge collection of half crowns in both side pockets, 
and the inside pocket. And from time to time, I would be compelled to make the weight a little lighter in order to get to see these films. I saw a load of rubbish, I suppose, like B-movies. And actually, they influenced me with regard to the way I saw life. Because in the, in the B-movies, the villains all get their comeuppance, and sometimes they make amends for what they've done. And everything is happy. All the nice people are terribly nice. And that's the way I saw it. Oh, yeah, Blues in the Night. I saw a film called Blues in the Night. The story was about five jazz musicians working their way across America, trying to make it. And at the time, I was very moved by the whole thing. I've seen it since, and it's rubbish, of course. But like the lifestyle, like the suffering and the playing of the blues and the jazz, got hold of an accordion round about that time and started learning popular tunes of the time, things like Chattanooga Choo Choo. Actually, I learned a lot of it from listening to the radio upstairs, because I, I never had, we never had a radio, but the people upstairs did. And I used to sit at the foot of the stairs and listen to people like Harry Roy, I, um, Oscar Rabin, and I used to listen to those tunes and then go and try and sort them out on the accordion. How did you make your entry into show business? That was in a show at the Trocadero Elephant and Castle. A sort of a patriotic thing to keep the castle's morale up. I played um, accordion in that. I did a solo. I played... I haven't said thanks for that lovely weekend. And I also had other parts where I wore a uniform and came off a landing craft with a rifle. And I think I, along with everybody else, I sang a song of, of the time about we're going to go in there and win and we're doing it. You know, one of those. On your 16th birthday, you became a professional. Yes, I joined ENSA, a place called Cosham near Portsmouth. I opened up with a five-handed show in factories around that area, you know, we used to go in at lunchtime and we used to put up with them and they used to put up with us. When did you start playing the piano? That came towards the end of the ENSA period and then the RF finally caught up with me. I did the usual thing, square bashing. Around about that time, a thing came around saying, can you play entertain, anything like that. RAF game show needs you. I went down for an audition. I did it on a mini piano and I played uh, riding along on a crest of a wave, right? And that was okay. So they, <laughs> it wasn't really, it was terrible. It, oh, I don't know how to describe a game show. I'll tell you the sort of acts we had in it. There was a, a man from Blockswitch who sang Take Thou This Rose, a man who played Hawaiian guitar, also at the time a guy called Rex Jameson who later became Mrs Shufflewick. I accompanied the musical items. I also did an accordion solo, played the Minute Wars. Terrible. Wrong. It took me about two minutes on a good night. Uh, I used to do Honky Tonk Train Blues and a thing that I'd composed sort of a, in the Debussy manner. Thank God, I can't remember what that sounds like. It was just an impression of an impression. And after you were demobbed, where did you get your first steady job? That was at the Paramount Tottenham Court Road with the Melfi Trio, which is a very rare trio indeed. 
Melfi played guitar, lute, and I would play accordion again, and we played some terrible rubbish. Actually, the uh, audience was mainly m members of the black community in that area. That they used to use that as their their place, and uh, they, they didn't like what we did at all. That all they did was like suffer us until the big band came on. But during that time, they started a, a jazz night on Monday. It was during that period, on those Monday nights, that I got to know jazz musicians of the time, you know, people like Ronnie Scott. And one of the drummers who came there was called Laurie Morgan, and he took an interest in what I was doing, and he suggested that I was ready to go into jazz and I should give up this life. So that's what I did. He asked me to go with a band he was forming, which had a beautiful title. It was called Laurie Morgan's Elevated Music. I think it was supposed to mean that we were playing music which was a little above the ordinary. We used to play um, one or two Thelonious Monk tunes. Actually, that whole period with regard to the music was sheer magic, listening to the records, trying to find out about it, working out the chords. you joined the musical staff of the Queen Mary. What was that like? That was a great period in my life. I <laughs> hate because I got to see all the old movies all over again on the boat, because they you know, used to show movies going in every day. It certainly wasn't for the money. I can remember, I think it was like £11 something per week. And when you arrive in New York with £22, you know, you can't go many places. You can go to Birdland, pay you one dollar to get in, not have a drink, just sit there. That's what I used to do. I got to Birdland and I heard a whole host of talent there. People like Charlie Parker. Actually, I, I caught the quintet with uh, Charlie Parker, Dizzy Gillespie, Tommy Potter, Bud Powell and Max Roach. You know, that was a thrill. I saw Parker with strings. I saw, or heard, I should say, Ellington, Count Basie. I heard of Birdland, Lester Young. Every name that was around at that time, I caught them there. I just used to wait until the place opened and then until it closed. <laughs>
you can't teach jazz really. All you can do is feed information about technique, about harmony, about progressions, about substitutions in harmony. But you can't actually teach it. All you can do is feed that in and hope that it kindles the spirit. To get off a little bit. Yeah, just start to move. Uh, yeah. Another another good thing for getting into r rhythmic patterns is to use, uh, say, a pentatonic scale. Like pure exercise. Say, so let, let's do it in um, in C, right? Right. This is the scale. And what I'm, the way I'm thinking about this, is like these are tuned drums to the pentatonic scale, okay? But I'm not restricting myself to a closed closed area like that. I, I'm, I'm gonna, I, I, might, I might go. this bit and I, I know I'm filling it out quite a bit um, I think you should be also aware of the value of space okay now I'll do the same thing again using more space okay, here we go I did a sort of mixture there. Some space, some busy. Just, is, is that tempo okay for you? Yeah, fine, yeah. All right, just, just have a little probe around on that, see, see how it feels. No, that's all right. Now, you, you, you're still sort of thinking in terms thinking of melody. left hand, right hand. Mm. Try mixing them. I mean, c come down to the area where I am on the keyboard, and mm. you, you, you know, like a sax player uses the fingers like that. I mean, there's, there's no left hand does this bit and right hand does this bit, and that makes the, the thing, right? Do you think of it that way. both have an equal role to play in that sort of thing, as opposed to <laughs> what is happening there, your left hand is accompanying your right. Yeah. Uh, I'm, I'm thinking of them just working together. Okay, so try that, you know, just get pickety on the bottom. Start off at, at about this level. 
and with this sort of spacing. You know, Teddy Bear's picnic. I've been listening to African music now for about 20 odd years and I still listen to it. I still listen to the same records actually. There's one in particular, well, one of the first ones I bought, I, I still play it. I mean, it's scratched to hell, but it, it's, it's beautiful. I, I wish I could replace it. Everywhere I went, whichever town I was playing, I would go around all the record shops and look for the African sounds. The music said something to me. I don't know what it said, though. it just made me feel good, that's all I need to know. But at the same time, in the mid-50s, you moved into the commercial world of Basil Kirchin. That was a good one. Basil, really, at the, at the time I joined him, he really wanted to make it as a jazz band. Then somewhere along the way, he desperately wanted to put something down on record so that, I, actually, I think he was running out of money. So um, we did. One or two things like uh, Rock Around the World with Shaney Wallace. I, I actually I arranged that one. We did it uh, rock and roll in the French manner, in the German manner, in the English manner, the American, uh, and Chinese rock and roll. <laughs> this must have been a double side in 78. Yes, it, it would have to be a production of that sort. Was it a hit? <laughs> and is it hit the floor? No, it wasn't a hit, unfortunately. And then, then Basil went berserk. He, he, he really s searched around. And one of his great ideas at that time it never came to anything, thank God. He wanted me to... You, you know, like, everything you say is a musical note. So he thought that when we take one of Churchill's war speeches, notate it, make a hit out of that. Well, you know, the way Churchill spoke it, I, d I didn't even attempt it. He wanted me to actually take down the notes. I, I, I really didn't have faith in the outcome. Now, the next year, 1957, was a big year for you. You met your wife, Jackie. Yeah. Would it be right to say that she's looked after your career ever since? I guess you could say that, yes. She was responsible for my first album, you know, getting the opportunity to record it. That record actually was called Showcase, and it was an album of show tunes, and we needed, I think it was eight, eight show tunes, and I think I knew about five, and I had to go out and learn some. And at the time, I felt pretty cocky about the whole thing, but. I can't bear to hear it now. It's so... Um, it, it's naive, you know. It's like an old photograph of yourself and when young. You know, you can see what an innocent lad you were at the time. And I can hear what an innocent lad I was musically. But at this time you joined the mighty Ted Heath Orchestra. Yes. What are your keenest memories of life with Ted Heath, Stan? Well, certainly not the music. Um, my keenest memories, after years of travelling in broken down vans and coaches, coaches where we'd, you'd have an oil heater because couldn't afford the real thing, 
and suddenly to find that I was traveling in a, in a luxury coach, staying at good hotels and receiving a good fee for what I was doing. Those are my keenest memories. Um, also, a couple of trips I did to Canada and the States because, you know, I, I was champing at the jazz bit. I was aware that there was all this jazz talent in America. What I didn't realize, that there were a multitude of people who didn't care about jazz. What they liked was things like Ted Heath's music. And the band was very popular. We sold out every place we went. In fact, uh, one of the places we played, uh, I, I, I worked into a title. Um, a lot of people misinterpreted it. It was called Little Old Pottsville. Pottsville is actually in Pennsylvania, and I, I couldn't pass that one up. I had to make a little dedication. <laughs> your old friend Ronnie Scott opened his own jazz club and you became the resident pianist yeah. at the start of a very long spell uh -huh. playing with 28 Americans in all counting folks, yeah how do you look back on that period? that was a very happy period for me I learned more about playing jazz during that period than at any other time. Also the fact that I was working every night, six nights a week, sometimes seven, over a period of seven years. You know, I, I, I never took a break, I didn't take a holiday. It was like, it was Christmas every evening for me. I used to go, I couldn't wait to get there and start playing. It was beautiful. The ones that stand out Oh, Roland Kirk, Sonny Rollins, Youssef Latif. Each person w was a different story. I mean, I also got a big boot out working with people like Zoot Sims and Al Cohn. Um, Stan Getz, I enjoy working with. Uh, he's a tough man to work with. It was a period of learning and having fun. You can hear the dew falling and during this and same period, you came across a record of Dylan Thomas reciting his own poetry. That's right. Under Milk Wood. To see the black and folded town fast and slow asleep. It made a deep impression on me. Around about that time, I had the opportunity to record with the quartet. And then, in true B-movie, style. I was lying in bed one night and I suddenly thought, Milkwood. Do it for Milkwood, I'll write some music for that. I got out of bed, put on the record and stayed up until about six or seven in the morning and, and by that time I selected characters, situations, titles and then from there I wrote the music. I used to do most of my composing on the all-night bus, back from London. Make notes, ideas and things like that. Then when I got up next afternoon, check them out, see what worked, what didn't, and eventually wound up with an open suite. No good bio fishing from the dandy bar. The land fades, the sea flops silently away. 
And through the warm white cloud where he lies silky, tingling uneasy eastern music undoes him in a Japanese minute. Followed that, your health seemed to go downhill, and you faded from the scene. What happened? Yes, I was suffering from jazz strain at the time. What happened was that I became completely exhausted, and was starting to fall apart. So I came out of Ronnie's. Then there was a period of two years after that where I did practically nothing at all. It took me a long while to actually to recover physically from that period. And when I came out there, of course, I had to go back to what everybody else was doing, which was practically nothing. And um, I took it all terribly personally. So, uh, as I say, two years, I got down and down and down. I went on social security. And then I had this good idea about being a postman. What I wanted was a, a really mundane job. I mean, ideally, what I was looking for would be like a small room where I could transfer one load of stuff from one box and put it in another with nobody else there and just do that all day and go home. That's what I was looking for. But uh, postman was nearest I could get to that. And uh, I got as far as applying for an interview. And... Uh, my wife found out, the way wives do, and uh, she was instrumental in bringing about a thing called Musicians Action Group. She really started hustling on the jazz scene, you know, for, for everybody. Mike and I were saying what a drag it was that nobody gets a chance to play much. Gigs are rare and that practice isn't much fun. It's not like playing. You know, you, you don't use the same adrenaline. And, you see, he was, he was living down the road. He still does. So we said, well, let's get together, come round, we'll have a play together. So that's what happened. And at first, we, we used to... We used to sort of play on conventional changes. Then we started to get into a, a free area, and it felt good. 
and we were happy with it. And people seemed to like the duo. So we've been working at it ever since. in 1973 there was a concert at the South Bank in London yeah. to celebrate your 30 years in music. Well, incidentally, the idea first came from my wife um, to do the 30th anniversary concert. The jazz centre heard about it and said, yeah, that's a good idea. We'd like to put it on at the South Bank. Well, we hadn't been thinking about the South Bank and we couldn't think in those terms financially. So the Jazz Centre took it over and they presented it. Actually, it sold out. I was very... I restored a lot of my confidence that concert. Since that time, things have become better and uh, they've got as good as I, I think it's possible things can get in this country. And now it's time for Jazz in Britain, introduced by Charles Fox. Duke Ellington once defined the whole art of jazz composition in a remark he made during a railway journey from Cleveland to Pittsburgh. You can't write music properly, Duke said, unless you know how the man that'll play it plays poker. In other words, jazz composers write for particular musicians with their sounds and styles in mind. It's a method that's always been followed by the pianist composer whose octet you'll be hearing tonight, Stan Tracy, equally distinguished, of course, as a performer and a writer of jazz. The work is the Bracknell Connection, or part of it to be precise, a suite written with aid from the Arts Council of Great Britain and performed for the first time to much critical and popular acclaim at last summer's Bracknell Jazz Festival, which explains the title. The octet is the same as the one which played it then. Its nucleus is Stan's regular quartet, with Art Thiemann, tenor saxophone, Dave Green bass and Brian Spring drums. They are augmented by a trumpeter, Harry Beckett, 
trombonist Malcolm Griffiths and two saxophone players, Pete King Alto and Don Weller Tenor. Stan calls this movement the Fraggy Bar Waltz. I only use the piano to work out the voicings. I, I don't compose at the piano. And seeing it on paper and sort of half hearing the sounds of your head is one thing, but it, it's a completely different story once you hear it actually played back. So the period of writing is self-doubt, pain, putting yourself down, uh, finding out all the things you don't know, finding one or two little things that you haven't thought about before. But when it's all over, it feels good. If you don't have any formal training, what you have to do is ask the guys who are playing it what's possible, what isn't. And then you discover, if you know who, who you're writing for, that, that that person has a certain talent for doing a certain thing. And so like, you, you bring that into the arrangement that that, that, that talent that person has. <laughs>
once you go on and you start playing, like everything else is forgotten. And however the chemistry is at that time with whoever you're playing with, that's the way it comes out. The piano as such, it always has been just a means of producing sounds that I want to produce. I, I've never thought of the piano as a piano. <laughs> Wednesday. Is the quartet still your favourite musical context? Yeah, I think so. And does life still...